This podcast episode was produced for the glory of God and is brought to you in part by the Revive Our Hearts monthly partner team. 24 million children live in a home absent from their father. That's one out of three. This is spoken word artist Blair Lynn. She was one of those women who grew up with an absent father. When I was three years old, my mom moved uh, from Chicago to Los Angeles. And so I'm 3,000 miles away from my dad. And so our relationship was really, it was over the phone. And my dad is, he has a wonderful heart. He's such a kind man. But I felt like, I want to really get to know you. I want you to really know me and know what's going on. And, and so it was really hard for me, hard for me to understand my identity, who I was. Um, and so I wanted to talk to him and say, this is really hard. But I was too scared. I felt like if I open up to my dad and share with him how I feel, that maybe he'll, maybe I won't have these conversations every few months. You know, maybe that will be taken away too. So fear kept me quiet. And it wasn't until I was around 18, then I started being approached by guys and thinking, I have no idea what to even look for in a spouse, in a guy, right? So I had no model to go by. And as a result, I, I didn't have my dad's protection, right? So I found myself making compromises with men in hopes that, you know, I would find out who I was. Nancy DeMoss Walgamu says, when a woman is in a situation like this, it greatly affects how she views her heavenly father. Now, as women, our view of God is often shaped and strongly influenced by the men that we have known in our lives. And more so by a father or a husband or brothers, men that are closely related to us. And I know if we could go around the room and talk about what we think when we say the word father, there would probably be more women who would have painful thoughts than would have easy or blessed thoughts when they think about a father relationship. And so when I speak of God being our heavenly father, for many women today, that just makes them cringe. We're about to discover why we can trust our perfect heavenly father, even when our earthly fathers have let us down. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Lies Women Believe. It's Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022. I'm Dana Gresh. By God's grace, Blair Lynn has learned what it means to embrace God as a loving, heavenly father, even though her dad didn't have a big role in her life. She'll tell us more about what she's learned later in the program. First, Nancy will address something she wrote in the book, Lies Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. She addresses the lie, God is just like my earthly father. Perhaps you relate to one or more of these women who've written me about this matter. One woman said, I had a stepfather who was cruel to me, and it's very hard to accept that God is not like him at all. Another woman said, my dad is a Christian and a good guy, but I've never heard much encouragement from him. For instance, when I would help him paint, I would say, does this look okay? Hoping to hear, hey, that looks really nice. But he would only say, try not to whatever. Maybe that's why I imagined God finding fault instead of loving me unconditionally and accepting me. Another woman said, my father abandoned me when I was four years old. I have trouble relating to God as a father. One of the lies I have believed and still struggle with, she said, is God is not really there. Now, if you've been wounded by a father or a husband or another man that you trusted, you may find it extremely difficult to trust God. In fact, you may even find yourself being afraid of God or even angry with God. But I want to remind us that our Father in heaven is not like any other man or woman that you have ever known. In fact, the kindest, wisest, most compassionate, tender, earthly father is just a pale reflection of our heavenly father. At their best, every man is a flawed representation of God. 
That's why we can't get our view of God from other people, men or women. If you want to know what God's really like, you need to turn to the place where he's revealed himself, and that's in his word. If you want to know what God's really like, you need to get to know Jesus. Because the scripture says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So whatever Jesus is like, that's what God is like. Jesus came to reveal the Father heart of God to us and to make it possible for us to become adopted into the family of God. There are women in this room, and I can't tell by looking at you who you are, but there are some of you who are so afraid of God. So afraid of your father, God, afraid that he's going to abandon you, to disappoint you, to put you down or harm you as perhaps your earthly father did. Could I say that is not the spirit of God speaking within you? The spirit of God within us says, Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word that is a term of intimacy and endearment. It's a word of tenderness and Closeness, affection, dependency, that's the Spirit of God within you. God's Spirit within you has given you a spirit of intense longing and reaching out, longing to know God as your Father. The God of the Bible is a compassionate, tender, merciful Father. 1 John chapter 3 tells us how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. God knows your name. He keeps track of the most minute details of your life. He has lavished his love upon you. He knows the number of cells in your body, the number of hairs on your head, and for some of us that changes rather frequently. He collects, the scripture says, your tears in a bottle. He's intimately acquainted with you. His heart is stirred with compassion toward you. He rejoices over you with singing. He longs for an intimate relationship with you. That's the God of this book. Now, that doesn't mean that he gives us everything we want. No wise father would do that for his children. And it doesn't mean we can always understand his decisions. God is far too great for us to be able to plumb the depths of all of his decisions. And it doesn't mean that he never allows us to suffer pain. In fact, Hebrews 12 tells us at times God actually inflicts pain upon us. Why? Because he loves us. You say, that's a funny way of showing love. Well, Hebrews 12, 10 says that God disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. He's sanctifying us. He's transforming us. He's working on those rough edges and making us into the likeness of Jesus. So regardless of what we feel or what we think, the truth is that God is a good father who dearly loves his children and can be trusted with our lives. When you come to know the love of your Heavenly Father, it will transform not only your view of God, but also your ability to love and respond to others. Let me read to you a couple testimonies that illustrate that. One woman said, There were only two men in my life, my father and my husband. I tried every way imaginable to get them to love me. Both of them deserted me when I needed them most. I learned that only God can love me in the way I need to be loved. My father never talked to me when I was a teen. I could count on one hand the number of times, and they were all put-downs. I married my high school boyfriend, and he divorced me after 27 years of marriage. But once I came to understand the enormity of God's love that surpasses all understanding, I found that I did not need to earn love, and I was able to forgive and to love my father and my ex-husband. Another woman said, My father called me terrible names, one I won't even repeat here, when I had not even kissed a boy, things that accused her of being an immoral woman. She said he treated my mother horribly even until her death when I was 23 years old. I blamed him for a lot of the things I did. Once I truly realized that Jesus loves me, I was able to let go my anger toward my dad. I was able to see him in a different light and realize that the hurtful things he said about me were not true 
and that it matters most what my Heavenly Father sees in me. And by the way, once I was able to forgive my dad, and two hours later, she says, my six-year-old daughter and I talked, and I was able to lead her to Jesus. You see how the truth sets you free? To know God as your Father is to find acceptance, security, and peace. I love that verse in Psalm 27, where the scripture says, Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. He's infinitely different than any human father or man that we may know. That's Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth explaining why we can trust God to be a good father, even when earthly dads have let us down. Nancy will be back with a final thought, but earlier in the program, we heard the story of Blair Lynn. She felt such an absence of a father's love. Growing up, she only spoke with her dad on the phone every few months. She's learned the wonder that we can be adopted into God's family. Here she is at a True Woman conference talking about what it means to trust God as her father. Now, in the scripture, God is primarily chosen to identify himself as father. And there are few uh, times where he uh, compares himself to a mother, but overall, it is father, fatherhood uh, that we see, the fatherhood of God. And we cannot let the culture try to tell us that that is because, uh, you know, somehow God is a misogynist or Christianity is, you know, is demeaning to women. It is not that. I believe, actually, as we understand God as Father, it it actually will help us understand who we are as women. So God does not downplay us, right? This is just the way God has chosen to reveal himself. Um, And so we can praise God for this, right? This does not take away from our womanhood at all. It adds to as we understand who we are in Christ. So we want to look at who Jesus is or kind of go from the beginning, walk through what this, you know, how our adoption actually plays out. So Jesus is our brother. And so in Bruce Ware's book in the Trinity, he describes Jesus. And what he says is Jesus is not one third God, right? He is fully God and he eternally exists with the father and the Spirit. And each of them possess the full, identical, same nature, right? So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God. So while on the cross, the Father and Son relationship, it was marred, right? So Jesus, he was willing to be separate from his Father. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he made him, who is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we see while Jesus was on the cross, he eternally existed with the Father. There was never any disunity, never a broken piece of their relationship. They were always on one accord. And yet we see on the cross, what does he cry out? He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus is willing for the, I mean, to break His relationship with with the father was broken because he took on sin, not his own sin, but our sin, right? We deserve to be on that cross. But Jesus says, I, out of love, I'm going to do this. I'm going to bear the penalty, the wages of sin, which is death. So adoption comes through our new birth. So for those who have repented of their sin, and have placed their trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, they actually can call God their Father, which is amazing. And that's the result of this new birth, right? We see that in John 3, with Nicodemus coming at night and Jesus speaking about the new birth. But also in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And this is the beauty of adoption, right? The adopted child does not bring anything to the situation, but their need. You know, God doesn't just save us so that he would just tolerate us and say, okay, yeah, I save him. Okay, that's it. He says, no, I want to fellowship with you. I love you. I delight in you. Do you believe that God delights in you? 
Do you believe that God delights in you? Just you, who you are as a daughter of God. You know, there's a scripture that Jesus says. It's in John chapter 15, verse 9. He says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And I think if we meditate on that, I mean, just meditating upon that truth, he says, as the Father has loved me, this eternal love, he says, so have I loved you. And then he says, abide in my love. And I really, I mean, I feel like in my life, I I have had to fight to hold fast to the fact that the Lord loves me despite me. That when the Father looks at me, he sees Jesus. He sees Christ. Not that I am Christ, but he lives in me. And as a result, he loves me with an everlasting love. So adoption means that we have God as our father. We have God as our father. Just think about that. He's promised to care for us, to protect us, to provide for us. He will even discipline us in love, Scripture says in Hebrews 12. And he does this to show that we belong to him. So now we have a a new head of the house, right? We have a new role in the family, a new identity and purpose. Adoption means that we are loved and we are cared for. God saw fit to save us, not because we deserve it, but because of his mercy. Yes, we have God as our Abba Father. And so now we're a daughter restored. And a few things to note is that a restored daughter, right, she is forever secure in her father's arms. Is your relationship with God intimate? Do you realize you never did anything worthy for God to call you his daughter? So therefore, when we feel like we're not earning, right, or keeping up with God's grace, we never earned it to begin with, right? We were never good enough. We will never be good enough. God, the Bible says, your earthly father may have rejected you. Scripture says, right, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 2710 says, for my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. She's also able to cling to God, I believe, in a unique way. So I want to speak to the women who have had your father, right? You, you may be in this room and you had a wonderful father who was a believer, who was a model of, of our father, God. Even you, you have to trust God, Right? We have to love God more than our parents. But I believe those who do not have their father, right, or did not relate to their father, I believe that they can connect to God in a very unique way. It's similar to if anyone in this room has ever had a specific need, right? You know, I've been encouraged even by Johnny, who, Eric Sentata, who has great physical suffering, And even as we were praying on the prayer call before the conference, she had asked God, she said, Lord, just give me breath. And because of her suffering, she's able to cling to God in a unique way. How many of us ask God for breath? Help me to breathe. Help me to speak clearly without coughing, right? Her suffering allows her to depend upon God uniquely. If you've ever gone through a financial trial, right? Or you, for example, you don't know where you're gonna get your next meal. How are you gonna feed your family? You're clinging to God in a unique way and you're able to understand God as provider in a way that someone who's always had a meal, has an abundance of food, they may not understand. And so here is a unique opportunity. to meet with God in a way which never would have existed had everything kind of gone perfectly according to our plan. Although none of us would have ever requested to grow up either without a father or not being able to connect with our father, we can look at this as an opportunity to draw nearer and nearer to God. So you could go through a trial, and honestly, you may not be able to get your biological father on the phone, but you can pray 
right? You can get your heavenly father. He hears your prayers. God is good. And he gives these good gifts, even suffering, even these difficulties, ultimately for his glory, right? Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. The Bible says ultimately our suffering is what solidifies our hope. And that's why we're able to say thank you. Thank you, God, for these difficulties. Thank you for these trials, because you're working in a hope in me that I may not have had otherwise. I just want to share a personal story uh, from a friend of mine. And this, this friend shared with me, this is years ago, um, where she had been molested by her father for several years, from about the age of nine to 13. And when she was 13, got pregnant by her father. They told her to have, she had an abortion. They forced her to have an abortion. And then her family pretended as though it didn't happen. So I, I can only imagine what that might be like to feel alone and to try to bring up the circumstances and people shut you out as though you're the problem. Something's wrong with you. And, but it's, it's interesting, as my friend, she began to, um, so I met her actually when I was in Los Angeles, and she's from New York. And so um, we would fellowship together, we went to church together, and she just grew in the Lord, right? Grew in her adoption and understanding her, her identity in Christ. <clears throat> and we were going to this church, and this guy was interested in pursuing her. And she just kept turning him down. No, like, I mean, literally asked, will you marry me? <laughs> Three times uh, before she said yes. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was very, very persistent. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, but she finally said yes. But she faced a lot of fears, right? She had had a lot of brokenness, broken relationships uh, before becoming a believer. And when her fiance visited with her, they went to go see their family. And one of the people that they met was her dad. Uh, so they went to New York, sat down with the dad, and the fiance was able to minister Christ to her father. And it was amazing because my friend had forgiveness in her heart. Now, this whole time, her dad had not acknowledged his sin at all. He refused to acknowledge it, even when she went there with her fiance. But do you know that she asked him to give her away on her wedding day? And I just, I just thought, what an example of honoring your father, even when it doesn't seem like he deserves that honor, but to still say, I'm, I'm going to honor you. And the truth is, she'd already forgiven him in her, her heart, regardless whether he would acknowledge his sin or not. And it was some years into her marriage, really a couple years ago, she took another trip to New York to visit her family, visit her dad, and he finally apologized to her. But the thing is, like I said, she had forgiven him a long time ago, a long time ago. And she was free. She was a free woman because of this change that had happened through her and because she understood who she was in Christ. Right? She was not going to be held bound by the sin of her father even. God must give us his perspective. Right? We can only bear this type of fruit by walking in his spirit. And I don't know, again, your specific situation, but I do want to think through how can we start this healing process as we kind of close. I'm going to walk through this fairly quickly. So as we meditate on this reality of our new birth and our adoption in God, we can pray honestly about our hurts, first off. So you can take your fears, you can take your specific circumstances, before God. You don't have to hide. You don't have to pretend that the sin didn't happen. You can take it before God. Honestly, you can tell him how it made you feel. Tell him what's been going on in your heart and your life. You can get honest with God because he knows anyway. And uh, a scripture is in Matthew 5. It says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. So even begin to pray for your father. Pray for your dad. And the second thing here is to forgive, right? Because we have been forgiven, we can choose to forgive others. A good scripture to meditate on is the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. 
So those who are forgiven much love much. And again, your father may never ask for forgiveness or he may never have an opportunity to ask for your forgiveness. But you can still forgive him because you've been forgiven through Christ. And so the third thing is we can honor our father. This does not mean that you put yourself in a position to be in harm's way because I don't know the specific circumstances. But if there is no danger, pray about how you might be able to encourage your dad. Think about ways. Even with my father, my father was, like I said, he wasn't there. He wasn't able to provide. But I have a kind father. (laughs) He's a sweet man. And, you know, even in the times where I would come to visit him in Chicago, he would give me a little bag of candy, you know. (laughs) And, I mean, is there anything that your father has done? Did he take you to church? Did he provide for you? Did he give you a kiss on the cheek? Right? Did he, did he show love towards you? Think about those things. And maybe you can encourage your dad by sharing those things with him. And also, he's a member of a local church. The reason I put this here is I think this connects so much to our adoption. Because when we come to Christ, not only do we receive God as our father, but we receive brothers and sisters Spiritual mothers, spiritual fathers. We receive a family, right? We are the body of Christ. And it's beautiful how in 1 James, even the call that true religion is, part of that is taking care of orphans, right? That our call is to care for one another. And so you can have an opportunity, even if you didn't see a model in your father, you can look at your pastor maybe, or the godly men in your church, the godly women in your church, to see How do they relate to each other? The godly single women in your church. How do you submit to God? How are you submitting to authority? Talk to the children. What is your dad like? You know, how does he train you up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord? You can ask these questions, not to idolize, but to learn and to grow, to be blessed by the church. And now know you are no longer fatherless. Whatever lie that you are tempted to believe because your biological father is not there, you have a father, a heavenly father, a heavenly father who will never leave us and never forsake us. We are never alone. God is always with his children. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Personally, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's Blair Lynn, one of the speakers at the upcoming True Woman 22 conference. Blair felt let down by her earthly father, but she has discovered an amazing truth— that we can be adopted into God's family and know Him as a perfect father. Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth talks about this truth in her book, Lies Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. One of the lies she addresses in that book is this, God is just like my father. Now, we're all tempted to fall for lies, but this book is effective at identifying those deep down false beliefs that can trip us up. More importantly, The book also helps us know how to walk in truth. So I hope you'll get a copy of Lies Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free by visiting reviveourhearts.com. In fact, we'd like to send you the book when you make a donation of any size to help this ministry continue. When you visit reviveourhearts.com, you can give your gift of any amount and you'll see a place to request Lies Women Believe. Or call us at 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959 to make your donation and request the book. Tomorrow, we'll hear from two sisters who kept getting approached by agents saying, have you ever thought about becoming a model? And Nancy will address the lie. Physical beauty matters more than inward beauty. Please join us then. But right now, Nancy's back for a final thought. You find it hard to accept that your Heavenly Father loves you, that He accepts you. You may know it in your head, but have you ever had it connect to your heart? 
As I was preparing for this session, I just kept having in my mind's eye a picture of a father standing with outstretched arms, with a child, a little child, up on a table or a sofa, some higher place, and the dad saying, jump into daddy's arms. And I picture that child feeling so insecure, so fearful. What happens if I jump and he's not there? We have those feelings. What happens if we jump into the arms of God and find out he's not there? But that dad knows what that little boy hasn't experienced yet, that those arms are secure, they're strong. And I just pictured us as that little child with our heavenly father saying, jump, jump into my arms and underneath you will find are always the everlasting arms of our Heavenly Father. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss-Walgamuth is calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.